Seymour, you're being totally unfair and the teachers won't stand for it. Teachers, you don't have the guts to strike. You don't have the guts to take us all on. That's it. Strike. Attention, this is an emergency broadcast. All is well in the school. My authority as principal is total. Give me that. Attention, teachers. We're on strike. Ha! No, oh, no. Strike, Miss Over? Are you on Go home, children. Thank yeah. God, you know, I'm a podcaster. I am by no means a journalist. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like a Mario Judgment. You know, yeah. It's like a, 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 a you know, a pedantic geek and like a former drunken college radio DJ <laughs> slash uh, attempted rock crit, which is uh, turns out to be really great, tra- really great training to be a podcaster. <laughs> and on that note, hello, everybody. Welcome once again to giving the mic to the wrong person back after a short break. And all podcasts are day re- who aren't releasing weekly are kind of day regular required to state so that kind of a thing. I am your host, Jeremy, uh, joined here on a cold but not terribly cold and fortunately not heat wave Portland Sunday afternoon by uh, some old and new friends here to talk about a rather timely topic, and that is the strike and the teacher labor actions and charter schools and all that related goodness. Going around the table, if you could please uh, introduce yourself to our viewing audience. Hi, um, I'm Jody. I am a special education teacher um, in outer southeast Portland. So I'm working with 100% free and reduced lunch population, like 28 different languages spoken in our district. Um, And I've been a teacher for seven years, which is statistically abnormal for a special education teacher. I think the statistic is three years is the average for a special education teacher. So um, I am also on the executive board for my union local. Um, I'm the grievance rep. So I'm the person that sits in on the meetings when people are getting put on plans of assistance or potentially fired or in trouble for some reason. Um, Or when a principal is breaking our contract. So that is my role within the union. Um, I've been active in my union for about four years now in different capacities. And I was brought to being part of the union because I started teaching in Wisconsin. So when you, I was after Act 10, I started the year of the recall election for Scott Walker and 2011, wasn't it? Um, I started in 2012. Okay. So. Yeah, you're right. So that would, which yeah. would, was the, yes, yep. the year after. Yeah. So um, being in super high stress, super violent kind of surroundings in within my school um, and not really having super strong union protection, but still having very um, passionate union leaders um, and people who were still really fighting for this um, was pretty radicalizing, like seeing people who didn't have contractual bargaining rights and the protections that people in Oregon have, um, but still really strongly believing in unions, um, was set me out kind of (laughs) realizing from the beginning how valuable having a union is. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, My name is Candy Luisa Herrera. I am your friendly neighborhood union staffer. Uh, I work for uh, Washington Education Association um, as a, it's called Uniserve Director, which is the stupidest name ever. I just tell people I'm a union organizer. <laughs> like, the name doesn't tell you anything about the job. Uh, it's like, hey, jargon. Um, and I am a member of Portland DSA, and I should say, I should take the opportunity to say, noth- none of the opinions expressed in this show reflect <laughs> necessarily um, the opinions of WEA, they're all my own. And I'd like to chime in that my opinions are not my locals, and they are not that of OEAs either. I'm <laughs> um, glad we got that out of the way. Um, <laughs> uh, all my opinions are uh, 
uh, completely reflective in copyright and trademark, giving the Mike Industries uh, 2019. <laughs> I, uh, I built this podcast till I shall die upon it. <laughs> anyway, oh, uh, please, Candy, continue. Yeah, um, well, I got to say, I was a community organizer before I got into, before I got a union gig, so I was already sympathetic to, to, to unions. Um, but my background, I'm a formerly undocumented immigrant, and so that played a large role in kind of developing my consciousness. But the way I, it was, the way I got into organizing was so boring it was reading noam chomsky it was like reading a book and i'm like oh i should try to uh come to one of these meetings and um that's how i got radicalized but i mean i feel like the reasons why those books resonated with me was as a result of my lived experiences so i'm not going to just say i picked up a book randomly um and so that's how I got involved. So then I was doing community organizing for homeless rights and um, immigrants' rights, obviously. And then I, um, my union gig was in grad school. And um, I became, uh, as a uh, grad assistant, it was called GAU, University of Florida uh, Graduate Assistance United. I was going to say, where, where, where were you lo- located uh, during this? This was Gainesville, Florida. Okay. Yeah. So um, And so I immediately like jumped into it full steam and like i was um the steward chair so i changed uh, trained all the stewards and i was um part of the grievance committee and i was on the bargaining team and like everything you do I, i'm like yeah i'll do that and so um and i loved it and like i thought the reason i went to grad school was because i thought i wanted an international i wanted an international degree so i could uh <laughs> this is almost embarrassing to say so i could do uh international human rights in law school and then i realized um, for one thing, that's not going to change shit. <laughs> like all the ICC does is like um, persecute continental Africans, um, and so I realized like if I wanted to change stuff, it would be through the union movement. Like everybody has to work. Like that's a, it's such a universal um, principle. Like that's a struggle that we all deal with. So that was the reason why um, I was like labor. This is it. Like this is all I want to do, <laughs> and so I still feel that way. But well, yeah, yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Marge Hogan. I'm a Spanish teacher in Southwest Washington. I work in the Evergreen District. Um, it's the largest district in Southwest Washington, um, one of the larger districts in Washington State. We're also part of the Uniserve that Candy works for, um, the Riverside Uniserve. Um, there's a collection of locals. Um, and I've been in Evergreen since, I think, 2011. Um, I couldn't get a job when I first moved to Portland. I'm from the Northwest originally, but I, I moved away for um, undergraduate and graduate school. Um, so I went back to school to get my teaching certificate. And the year that I graduated, it was hard to get a job in Portland, in Beaverton, uh, uh, on this side of the river where I live. So I and a number of the people in my kind of graduating year ended up in um, Southwest Washington. And it is interesting to see how kind of the politics of each district and uh, different things that are going on at the state level make it more appealing or less appealing um, to work on either side of the river, just given the year and the current contracts mm-hmm. and the and the um, the kind of environment, administrative environment at the district level. Um, so I I'm teaching Spanish right now, first through fourth year. It's really enjoy it. Um, and I got into union work, I think, in my second year of teaching. Partly, I had, I think I had, like, a revelation at some point. It sounds very obvious now. But, um, y- you know, I think if you, if you grow up or you spend your college years or graduate school years kind of thinking about what can you do to support other people in their struggles or, or what can you do to change a system that you see is failing um, for the majority of people, um, it's actually really effective to start from where you are and what you're doing. And uh, I think it's really easy for us to get sucked into other people's kind of um, battles and, and engage in sort of an, an activism sort of lifestyle, um, which is, that's also great. But for me, I feel like I've um, uh, learned to be more effective by working where I am and, and, and with whom I am, if that m- makes sense. Um, it's not like I... Um, it's not like I think that uh, union organizing in my district is the most important thing for everybody to be doing, but it's important for me to be doing because that's where I live and breathe every day with my kids and my union brothers and sisters. That's what it comes down to, isn't it? Just kind of 
material circumstances on the ground where we, you know, the particularities of where, when, who, and what we're doing, um, kind of like can come together and kind of like force us into something better. Thank you very much. Yeah, I should say too that um, I, in in talking about you know union activism and also work that I represent myself only. Um, no, I'm not talking on behalf of my union. I'm currently serving as an executive officer in the union, but definitely doesn't, um, what I say here doesn't reflect on uh, on that body. Excellent. Thank you. So, the, uh, but uh, I want to thank you all for joining me here and uh, taking time out of uh, your day off um, <laughs> to come to come help provide emotional labor for me because I need... <laughs> I need educating. Mm-hmm. You know. Well, in fairness, you did offer the donuts. So. That's yeah. true. Uh, yeah. I offered donuts and tea, so I try to be a somewhat gracious host. And there, in, if anybody wants uh, wants uh, any, there are uh, cats available in the next room for petting. We are currently uh, zonked out on the bed and not actively fighting for once. You know, you, you take you, you one takes one moments when one cans. I guess we are currently in a. One hopes prolonged resurgence of not of not just labor action nationwide. Um, I think yeah, the, the the numbers just got came out very recently. That what was it? The number of like of like labor actions and strikes in 2018 was something like I can't. It was like just there's some huge, um, some huge like there like the number it was like was it like dozens more than there, than there have been for years? It was just like some huge momentous uh, increase. And um, and so I wanted to, I figured, you know, tie in the national, let's say the national story of that with our, with the fact that we, you know, hey, you know, in uh, in Portland Metro, we have, um, you know, we have our own group, you know, our own organized teachers who are also, you know, going through their own fights and, and so kind of like just tie in like the national story with the, with the local actions. Um, what do you think is a better tact? Should we, do we want to get into the history at all of from like, um, like Wisconsin and Chicago teacher actions through like the last few years until now, or do we should we start start focus more on like the local stuff? Or what are you feeling? I think just to give credit where credits due, yeah. I think it's, Chicago and yeah, I think and, giving a brief overview of kind of like there are these really big things where they really change the game and then. Mm-hmm. building up to the last two years. And this new school year is beginning. There is an uprising taking hold in the city of Chicago. Tonight, the biggest teacher strike in America in a generation is underway. 29,000 teachers out on the picket lines. 350,000 American students shut out of school. And here is the heart of the standoff. How do you judge if a teacher is good or not good enough in the classroom? And who should decide? Even though this is happening in Chicago tonight, it could light a fuse in American cities and towns across this country. And ABC's Alex Perez leads us off. It's the largest teacher strike this country has seen in more than two decades. 29,000 union members strong, refusing to go to work until they get what they want. We are fighting for dignity and respect and for a fair contract. We say fight back! The showdown pits the powerful teachers' union against Chicago's mayor, President Obama's former chief of staff, Rahm Emanuel. So, forty nine. I guess the, uh, we we come to uh, it's a brief side anecdote of like where I personally could, you know, I am not a uh, uh, I am not a teacher. I am from a family of teachers. Mm-hmm. Parents. My sister is. She teaches in Raleigh, and she was actually she went out on the the one day walkout they did. Was it in the summer? Whenever, whenever, when when North Carolina had their walkouts, she participated in that. And to my parents' credit, they at least supported. They're like, yeah, you know, they were fully. That's the thing. They watch Fox News, fully supportive of my sister because she's like, she's like, yeah, you know, they, they uh, were fully behind, you know, the union action. I figure this one out. I don't know. Anyway, um, you know, minor, you know, just a few minor issues here. Um, my brother was a substitute teacher for a little while after he graduated. I was starting to go through the paperwork of becoming a substitute teacher after I had lost a job in the early aughts and was living at uh, living back home, and I wound up not doing that, which is probably a good thing. So, like you know, with my own person, you know, but it's like so I am not. I'm the one person at this table who is not involved in, let's say, formal education. You didn't teach in grad school. 
I don't know. I never went to grad school. Oh, I thought you did. I'm sorry. My um, I was I was a student for six years. Okay. Uh, because sort I, of. Like. Yeah. <laughs> because I was a. Um, because I was a, I double majored in engineering, but I never actually went on to grad school. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. My thing is, um, so I don't come from my, my I come from a family of, like, um, custodians and like, uh, housekeepers and stuff like that. But the reason why I, vet, the reason why I wanted to go into education unions is because I was, I was, I was undocumented and it was just like, you don't, you're kind of forced to value education when, <laughs> when you're not allowed to engage in it. And so um, I couldn't go to school until I was 21. And I was just like, and all I wanted to do was go to school. Like, all I wanted to do was to stop. Like, I had like three jobs. I was washing dishes at two of them. Like, um, and it was just like, it's like, all I want to do is study and um, get out of this. And so that's part of what... Um, that's part of the reason why I got into education unions and also the fact that it's female dominated and like, um, I'm a feminist and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm drawn to that. I was going to say one, one little note that, uh, as Sarah Jaffe, you know, labor reporter and podcaster extraordinaire herself, it pointed out, um, also she's, if you ever get a chance, listen to Sarah Jaffe when she's on a podcast. She's also extremely fucking funny. She pointed out, especially in um, in Wisconsin, because I guess we're we give the history to go to the, the current moment in Wisconsin. Like Walker targeted, deliberately targeted um, nurses and teachers, uh, and uh, which you know just shockingly tend to be you know mainly women. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, as yeah. opposed to say the police and the firemen's unions, which were excerpted from all of the uh, that was the, that was the thing in Wisconsin, mm-hmm. wasn't yes. it? Yeah, there's in Florida every time. So there was an attack on the pensions like every other year in Florida, and then every time they filed a bill, they always carved out the um, the police and the firefighters' unions, and so it's like clear sexism, like. There's no, um, the firefighters are fairly new. They're like this, I don't know, like the Switzerland of union. Mm-hmm. Like they don't have to take yeah. a side of stuff. <laughs> but, um, the policemen are, are, uh, or the police officers union, like they're always on the worst side of political issues. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And being, starting my professional career in Wisconsin, like I don't even think I ever gave a thought to that there were other unions outside of teaching and nursing, really. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, just my, obviously I know other industries are unionized. My family is comes from very strong union miners um, in northern Minnesota, but um, the climate in Wisconsin, like people only talked about, you know, those shrill screaming harpies down mm-hmm. at <laughs> down in Madison trying to fight for teachers getting paid more than hard working policemen or whatever I, you know and so the rhetoric was very sexist in a lot of ways that I would hear um, but at the same point like I don't know where I'm going with that <laughs> yeah. One, thing, yeah. one thing I was curious about I wonder um, that folks who know more about this could um could explore it, that I find it really interesting that one reason that people uphold um, sort of the victories in the uh, Chicago Teachers Union and and um, some of those early uh, battles in the current wave of, of um, teacher unionism is because people began to form contracts that were created in consultation with communities and families and contracts that were uh, a designed specifically to drive community priorities and not just wages and benefits. Mm -hmm. And that that was something that has become inspiring um, and very effective, you know, um, in achieving those goals, but also inspiring in a way that it kind of circumvents that greedy teacher argument Mm -hmm. um, because you're basing the contract not just on what you want for yourself, but also um, what your community has explicitly told you that they need from their schools. I wonder if people have like reflections on that for i don't i don't know a lot about specifically how that developed yeah. in chicago or I, so, oh go ahead i was gonna say there's a there's a labor notes book mm-hmm. and it has the most forgettable name uh but it's about the CTUs. i know i own it and i don't even, can't even uh, it's think just about like the, the worst name, name. <laughs> um it but uh do i haven't it's like reviving no uh jump, how to jumpstart your union okay yeah okay. God, that is a stupid name um, it should be like a narrative. It's Chicago Teachers <laughs> Union strike. Like that'd be so much more compelling to see on a book cover. Anyway, 
Um, so I, it talks about it. Oh, go ahead, Jim. Oh, no, so I know at least, I think both Haymarket and, and Jacobin have both put out... Have both put out like books on it in in the, within the last couple of years of like Chicago specifically because I think Chicago is one of those things where I wanted to bring it up because yeah you had all, well, first you had like all the um like the big action you know the big union action in 2011 like you know, which was I think it was was it statewide in Wisconsin because I know because we heard about it we definitely heard about it in Portland and I can remember um on like our message boards talking about it and like and even you know John Darniel. I can never pronounce his name. I've known the guy online for years. I can never figure out how to pronounce his name properly. Darnier Darnell uh, from the Mountain Goats was recorded. Um, was like recording videos of him, um, you know, him performing "Power and Union" in solidarity. There is power in the factory. There is power in the land. There is power in the hand of the worker but it all amounts to nothing if together we don't stand oh there is power in a union they they kind of made unfortunate choices with how the uh, how they decided to do the union thing and in, in, you know feeding that into a recall election which right it was in 2011 um i did i was still living in Oregon and I had not yet moved there so I'm not super well versed in what happened before me because mm -hmm. you know I live in that only child universe of if I'm, <laughs> if I'm not involved it didn't happen you know um <laughs> just kidding um could you could you talk about why that failed oh god I don't even know um oh, okay. <laughs> I mean yeah I let me think on that um, yeah, to yeah, why, yeah, like, right. and read something by someone smarter than me to, but I, I, you know, I have my theories, but I think it just also came of a time when we were seeing Tea Party being like this force in politics and just the super right swing all mm -hmm. around and to have something so left as like thousands of people marching in Madison, um, it was very contrary to like the rest of the nation's movement towards, you know, give me liberty or give me death, <laughs> you know, right. snake flags. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, yeah, they, they had the fucking Tea Party rallies in Portland too. Oh yeah. <laughs> it was dumb, uh, at the at, at, I'm not going to mention the business, but there's a certain business on Burnside where I can remember having them having it in a parking lot. Parking lot is now a condo, but anyway. And like this is totally just me. I don't have any evidence to back this up. Um, and I could be totally wrong on this, but in Wisconsin in particular, I have a feeling that it is very rooted in racism because if you look at where Scott Walker is from, where this conservative base in Wisconsin is, it's all the outer suburbs. It's very, very white. It's very much higher income. Mm -hmm. And then you have thousands and thousands of teachers in Milwaukee um, where it is very black and it is very, very, very poor. And a lot of what teachers were talking about really greatly impacted s students from poverty and students of color um, because of the long historical charter voucher system um, in Milwaukee. Most of the white students go to very specific schools. Mm -hmm. And if they're public schools, there's like two or three high schools that maybe there are a, a lot of white kids and the rest of the white kids go to charters or vouchers. Um, so I think perhaps that when people are talking about education, the people with the loudest voices, the people with most privilege are looking at their children's experiences or their experiences in schools and going, what? It's not... It's not that bad. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? And we're like, but you're not living in the urban centers and you're not a teacher, you know, and like in being a teacher in those centers, it's super eye opening and it's super eye opening to not just like education, but also the intersectional struggles that people in those very segregated places feel mm -hmm. because Milwaukee is the most segregated city in the United States. Um, it's super clear, like the lines are super drawn and clear and historical, like 
this is where white people live, this is where black people live, this is where Hispanic people live, um, and never the never the two shall meet. <laughs> mm-hmm. And um, so when I think about like, I wonder how much that had to play in why the union struggles weren't more successful. Mm-hmm. Is just kind of that fervor around right wing ideas at the time, and just kind of a shielding from the realities of what a lot of teachers were seeing. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah, because yeah. I can. <laughs> I remember um, I was actually in Wisconsin a lot around that time, and I can remember seeing, especially during the the, because I think what was it the the strikes kind of didn't fizzled out, and they decided to to do the recall campaign. Mm-hmm. And I think yeah, this is like 2011 because I can remember being in Wisconsin because we had customers in Wausau, and uh, a lot of much more much more Amish people in Wausau in, in like central Wisconsin than you would think. Mm-hmm. You know, I guess you know the cheesemakers would congregate together. Also, visit Abbotsford if you've had a chance. A lot of good uh, little dairy shops there. Um, but I, I just remember seeing like just the billboards for the recall campaign, even you know in the, my brief time visiting there. And but there's kind of a thing where, they, but yeah, it will, um, actually getting back to what you'd mentioned before about the uh, the limited imagination of like a lot of like you know traditional union types is like you know we our political activity can only be funnel you know is only in funneled through the you know certain channels and certain channels alone like we have to go through establishment like well well you know we we'll do this you know if we can't do it a traditional strike we'll do like a traditional electoral type campaign and like that's it and you know so kind of there's not enough uh expansion of even like imagination yeah like one of the criticisms that i read about what happened in madison was that you know there was so much energy at the capitol and they had it was like a perfect it would have been a perfect time to declare a general strike and there was so much um support that they it could have been um i mean i'm not sure how there was potential that it could have been successful and that they didn't do it because they were too scared well and also looking at this a lot of the changes that walker enacted didn't include um firemen or policemen or it was very specifically targeting and so i feel like probably a lot of union people were like well that's not my struggle Mm -hmm. and there wasn't that solidarity built (laughs) yeah i you know because you you hear about the midwest about being so union strong you know and it um just as a result of the uh uh, the industrial unions there and Mm -hmm. uh, obviously auto workers but the my understanding is that that there it it transformed from from to basically transactional unionism, and so you know when you have more it's tra- it's you know they say the dichotomy is transactional versus tr- um, transformational unionism, where you have more uh, you know rank and file activism, you have um, relationships with other unions, you have relationships with the community, and so when this types of things when you get attacks, you're ready for them because you've built these re- built and nurtured these relationships for a long time and your membership is engaged. Um, and so my understanding is that's what kind of what happened in the Midwest is that it just went into transactional unionism. And so that's why everybody was so unprepared. You know, that's why you didn't have relationships with like the firefighters. They will step up occasionally. And they were in Madison as well. Yeah. Like I, I, I'm not meaning to dismiss them as like they didn't right. do anything. Of course they did but i feel like the brunt of it was placed on those non-public safety unions public unions right i wonder if too how much of it has to do with just like you're saying there are certain um jo- policemen and firemen that were um exempted from those changes there's also a huge part of the workforce that might have grown up like candy said those union values with a union grandpa with a union mom but the jobs that they're working in now are not union jobs and so it means that you have to step outside of your own role to really recognize oh yeah what what i remember my parents talking about what i remember my grandparents talking about that's what's happening with teachers right now because if you're not a union member yourself then you have to you know take that on for someone else well and you know my fa- like i said before my family is very from like coal miner union or not coal miner taconite miner unions um and so my family that stayed in northern minnesota are still super like union democrats um but my parents left they didn't want to be in that like they wanted to leave and though both of them worked in nursing um they were they are not union people like they 
mm-hmm. were obligatory members, but they were they are not supportive of unions. Um, and I think that there was there might be just that generational shift, you know, between like my parents' age, you know, who came of age and working in like the sixties and seventies, um, versus now we're realizing once we started going away from unionized, like our generation is a little more like, wait, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Parents were wrong. That's weird. <laughs> yeah. When we talk a lot about um, at within uh, the union at local conversations and also at the state level about um, especially facing, you know, a, a post Janus decision world, what is it that we are doing? I'm not sure that they would articulate it in terms of transformational unionism. Obviously that's, you know, more uh, a better goal, I think, for us. But um, what are we doing to be relevant for incoming teachers and recognizing that for a lot of teachers, even if they don't think, you know, the gra- people graduating from teaching programs, a lot of times they might not think of themselves as career educators, but they might be interested in teaching because um, they have a, a kind of a profound interest in social justice or they want to work in something that's related mm-hmm. to social justice. And so the union has to look at, like, what can we do that... It, that makes us clearly not just a service model union mm-hmm. that demonstrates that we, um, as a union, support them in that, support students, support communities, um, so that those incoming educators will feel like, oh, I see that the union is the professional body that does these things, you know, in our communities. Can we um, do a brief explainer of what the of the Janus decision? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's... I, I, I don't want to get into the legal arguments for it because um, they're uh, spurry. I mean, they, they're they're just they're they're stupid arguments. Um, the only reason why Janus was uh, the Janus challenge was successful against unions is because of the makeup of the Supreme Court. So, like, I don't I don't give a whole lot of credence to the arguments. Like, it's not like oh, well, they were really right, and they're you know. So anyway, uh, Janus, what it basically did is um, it got rid of agency fee, uh, also known as fair share dues. So, like, in a lot of ooh, I think in half of the states in the United States. Um, what was the case two years ago is they were uh, called fair share states. So you don't, you are not compelled to join the union. You don't have to join the union, but you do have to pay a certain amount of union dues. You hear people use the phrase closed shop. Um, that's absolutely not true. Like closed shop hasn't been around since the Wagner Act, you know, um, in the 1940s. So that it's not the case. There's no place that where you are, you absolutely have to join the union, but with fair share, you don't have to join, but you have to pay a certain, per, certain percentage. And um, Janice did away with that. Um, and so that was, what was it, May of last year mm-hmm. it happened. Yeah. Um, and then it's, you know, folks argue about how this is, <laughs> it might be beneficial for unions because it's going to force them to, you know, the ones that, that have kind of uh, gotten comfortable with transactional, uh, with um, service with essentially just providing a service as opposed to an opportunity for worker empowerment, it's going to force them to actually go out and do stuff for their members. Um, I will say, and I'm being absolutely sincere, not just because of the disclaimer that I gave at the beginning, WA is like a really good union. They're like the best union ever worked for. And so they've consistently, like, I don't have a whole lot of um, fear that WA isn't going to be able to keep membership, but I can certainly think of locals in my head that are going to have to change like you adapt or die, you know, and that's kind of the way that the union movement um, is the direction that they're going. And so I don't know. I decided after like, it was like the day after a Janice decision. I'm like, I'm not going to be afraid anymore. Like I'm going to do the best that I can. And uh, you know, whatever happens happens. Like I don't like, I didn't get into the union movement to be afraid. It's the opposite. <laughs> So, um, and I, I think that the wave of strikes you've seen as a result is, is really inspiring, you know, in the wake of this decision. And so, um, that's like the one thing, and just despite everything that's going on politically with the current regime and stuff like that, like that's a really, I think a ray of hope in terms of what's, you know, in contrast to what's been going on. You mean the ray of hope is, um, seeing people's response to the Janus decision being increased unionism instead of... An well, I was saying this, right. Yeah, I was yeah. saying this, the strikes specifically, mm-hmm. the teacher strikes, and that it's you know it's again led by women. I think that's really remarkable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know we were freaking out to an extent, like 
about how how are we going to keep our union membership? Like we are, we've always only had like a hand, like two or three people on fair share. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, how are we going to make sure that we? Can, and it hasn't really hit us in all of East County. All almost all the unions are at about the same percentage of fair of non members as we were of fair share members before. So, and if and even then, like in my local, we definitely saw people who had been fair share come around and be like, well, no, I'll just be a member. It's, you know, so that has been really relieving, but it doesn't mean that we can get comfortable. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know that everyone is thinking that and is planning for that. And it has been um, exciting seeing people's language around what are we going to do change and to make it a little bit more um, exciting and (laughs) a little bit more energetic and more about how can we get more people in mm-hmm. into that core and into that to so that we're keeping the momentum up and we're not losing members as Janice ages. Yeah, we, we're talking a little bit about the strength, I'm assuming like at the local level and also maybe at the state and national level, kind of the strength of your membership and maintaining those numbers. But a big, um, I think a fear that people were um, facing in the Janice decision and that I think continues to be with us is the building level relationships Mm -hmm. when you have some people who are essentially freeloaders and others who are paying their union dues. And I think that's something that we have yet to, at least in my local, we have yet to really come to terms with what does that look like um, in an environment where people are increasingly, new teachers are increasingly making that choice, even if we retain people on our roles that have been teachers you know, for years, that as new teachers come in and get to choose to be a union member or not, what are we doing to make sure that... um, they feel welcome and that that they feel that that's an essential part of being a part of their, you know, their building site. Because I think the Abu decision that came, I think it was the 1973 decision that made it such that we could have agency fee was meant in part to ameliorate those those, uh, workplace relationships where there was a lot of pressure to join the union and people felt that there, you know, Mm -hmm. there was um, ambiguity and animosity in those relationships, you know. So I think that's, besides just keeping the, the roster of members, you know, at the state and local level, that those interpersonal relationships are something that may change as well. It's really hard to tell someone with $40,000 of debt, like, that it's hard to convince them why that they need to spend the money to pay their dues if you're not offering them something worth those dues. Mm-hmm. So Absolutely. I think that has been a big consideration of, like, Besides contract bargaining, besides, you know, representation, what more do we need to really validate those expenses that people coming in with tremendous amounts of debt, you know, what what are we offering them? Oh, my God. I wish I had $40,000 <laughs> worth of debt. <laughs> more than that. Um, but I was going to say, like, with the because we've uh, talked about this at our council, actually. Um, and again, full disclaimer, none of the op- opinions express- expressed by Kenny <laughs> are necessarily respect, uh, reflect the opinions of WA. But like one of the things I said was that uh, like when you ask people for membership, you have to believe that they are they're going to be a better per- like they're going to be in a better situation as a result of being a union member. Like you can't go in there and ask them for 800 bucks or whatever. Like you can't act like that. <laughs> you have right. to convince yourself, <laughs> yeah, that they are in a better position as a result of paying the $800 because they're going to get it back. So, you know, however many, mm-hmm. uh, however much. And like that was proven with the strikes. I mean, in Southwest Washington, um, now if you have 17 years of experience, which is a long time, I'm not going to, you know, knock that, but you have 17 years of experience and a master's degree, you will top out the lowest you will top out is 93 and then the highest is $98,000, which is, I mean, that's pretty good. That's what teachers should be paid, if not more, honestly, mm-hmm. uh, for, for for the jobs that teachers have, which is producing, is you know, they, they very clearly produce a social good. Like, that is unequivocally the, the truth. And... Um, it's not valued the way that it should be, but that's still a fact. And, um, you know, they, they clearly saw the result of um, the, the power of union membership. Now, is it a, are we going to be getting those raises every year? Of course not, right? So that's something to keep in mind. But 
You know, in fact, when you look at those kind of funding cycles in the past in Washington State, you're looking at these maybe 20-year funding cycles where this is the raise that we get, you know, but between now and, and 20, yeah. you know, 40 or something. So, so it, um, well, I, you don't want to assume that that's going to be the truth. It is really important to fight for the funding that was due us from the state that was earmarked for that specific purpose because it's not coming again next year. Right, you know? right, yeah. Yeah. Um, but there's like I've read that like uh, young people are, it's a simple majority, but like, peop millennials, are, s um, a majority in favor of un like they have a favorable favorable opinion of unions. Mm -hmm. So as long as we do our job, and make union membership relevant to their lives, like I think that we should be fine. And maybe I'm being, I'm not being cautious enough, um, but I feel like I, I like to act optimistic because I feel like that's a reflection of my politics. Like we always have to be optimistic, I feel, else we just <laughs> descend into this deep <laughs> hole of cynicism. Yeah. It's like, well, what, what, is, what good is that? Seymour, the teachers are fed up. You have to start putting money back into the school. You cut back on everything. Salaries, supplies, the food. I don't care what you say, I can taste the newspaper. Posh, shredded newspapers add much needed roughage and essential inks. Besides, you didn't notice the old gym mats. There's very little meat in these gym mats. Our demands are very reasonable. By ignoring them, you're selling out these children's futures. Oh, come on, Edna. We both know these children have no future. <laughs> Prove me wrong, kids. Prove me wrong. Uh, can you, yeah, can we, bring in these things local, can you talk about, like, the, because I think that both... Was it both uh, like Vancouver school districts and also like the support work uh, support staff? I think both had uh, either you know were either about to or did go on strike for a little bit. And it's like, can you in it within the last shit four months, six months? Yeah, so maybe I can talk a little bit about um, the Evergreens experience, and then Candy, if you want to talk a little bit about VASP and the support staff experience. Or, um, uh, so we have. Um, a, like I said, we're one of the largest locals in the state and um, the largest in Southwest Washington. So a couple years, just to rewind, a couple years ago um, when the state, the union at the state level began to see that, okay, it looks like um, we are going to be receiving money based on this McCleary decision, which is the historical Supreme Court decision in, in Washington State that said um, that the legislature was not doing its what's called paramount duty. The Washington state has a special constitution that um, states that the paramount duty of the state is to fund public education. So the Supreme Court called the legislature on that and said, hey, you're not doing your job. Um, legislature continued to not fund education and was held in contempt of court until finally last year they squeezed out um, a deal that was kind of a, a basic um, uh, backfill on some funding that we needed, but it, it, it hasn't, let's say, been like a huge boon um, to education. So in leading up to that decision, we got a lot of support from our state level organizers, a lot of help from staff in forming strong contracts um, leading up to uh, the that legislative decision last year, um, partly with the idea that, hey, we need to really work to create a strong standard and a strong sort of floor in terms of salaries and benefits. Um, if we know that a lot of things are going to get renegotiated, um, what ended up being this past year. So we got um, some help from the state level union um, a couple years ago in our most recent contract. And then when the McCleary money came down, um, we ended up being, uh, we had just a, worked to have a reopener on our contract just in terms of um, salaries in the final year of that three year um, contract. So, one thing that I think was really interesting was um, we have, like Candy said, I think WEA is a great union in so many respects. Lots of problems, like any giant, you know, body of um, <laughs> of teachers or, or professionals would be. But um, we have had a lot of support from them. It happened that our strike last year happened in a year when there was tons of strikes going around on around the state because of that legislative change in funding. So. We ended up um, having rank and file and some just kind of local leadership stepping into roles that would have traditionally been staff roles. Um, traditionally, meaning in any normal strike context, staff would come from, you know, different parts of the state um, to help uh, do the organizing work. So for us, it was really 
a great experience in terms of building leadership at the local level. We had to have just our union brothers and sisters who um, were ready to go back to work in September have to step out of preparing for that role and instead work as zone leads and picket captains and and strike coordinators um, in a way that was really unique. I think it, it was great for us to be able to work hand in hand with WEA staff, with state level staff, um, but also to have the power to um, be making those decisions and doing that organizing ourselves. Yeah, there were uh, 16 strikes last year for WEA, which is a lot. I'm told mm-hmm. it felt like a lot. Shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was, um, uh, I-, I was negotiating the contracts for my locals. And so, um, I, w- I worked, it was like, I think a 22 days straight. Like I didn't, I, I kind of, it was, re- it was a blur. It was a mm-hmm. lot of work though. Um, and so that's historical. Like we're probably not going to see that again. Um, but, uh, in terms of your question, there were so there were 16 strikes and then seven of them were in southwest washington um eight if you count uh the vas strike so we call them esps they're basically non-instructional staff um so everybody but the teachers and everybody but the administrators obviously excluding management and so they um everybody received the mccleary money you know and so um i think management thinks that they can withhold it um, to a greater degree from non-instructional staff because they don't see them as quite as militant. And uh, VASP uh, certainly proved them wrong. Mm-hmm. So VASP was on strike for... Okay, so it's so it's technically eight minutes, but <laughs> you got to mm-hmm. understand how mm-hmm. much work goes into the build-up. Mm-hmm. Like, you build up, you know, whether or not you think, like, we're going to settle in the last minute. And so it was a lot of work. Um, and so all the strikes, like, all the signs were made... Um, and uh, it's funny is that we just took old signs and then we printed uh, Vancouver Education Support Personnel and we just stuck it on the name of the what was like a Hawkinson education <laughs> on strike sign. Uh, it's like kind of guerrilla strike organizing. Oh, there and you so, go. Yeah. yeah. And so um, they received like the lowest paid workers um, in uh, Vancouver School District got like a two dollar an hour raise. Mm. So that was pretty significant. Um, so, yeah, what was the other thing that you had asked? I'm sorry, Jeremy. I don't remember. Um, I think it was just, just tie, tying it into just low, uh, because I just wanted, you know, like the national story into like the local action. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. So, okay. So it's funny. So I'm, I enjoyed labor history, reading about labor history in my um, free time. And so all of a sudden I heard, there's a guy, there's my friend, my homie, uh, his name's Joe Burns. He wrote Reviving the Strike. And he said he referenced, so he keeps posting on Facebook, like all these articles about the teacher strikes, right? And then he posted about WA and then that's the more traditional strike, which is funny because it's like, what, how, I feel like I, I take umbrage with the way that strikes are defined um, because ultimately it's about worker empowerment, right? But we're kind of <laughs> in the wake of like Wagner Act still like kind of bureaucratizing strikes. So anyway, mm-hmm. my whole point is that like I got into like I disagree with him about the 2006 May Day strike, which was all about it was like day without an immigrant. So like a bunch of people didn't go to work as a way of uh, demonstrating um, how important uh, immigrant labor is. And he doesn't consider that a strike. He's like, oh, that was a political strike. And I'm like, people didn't go to work. Like, how is that? Strike is strike. Yeah. Strike is strike. And like even historian Kim Moody, who would not take a selfie with me. <laughs> Kim Moody wouldn't take a selfie with me. Like, he recognizes the May Day strike as a strike. And so now, because you have teachers doing these walkouts and these strikes, and they're in, they're not striking the employer, they're striking the state, so to speak, um, that that's how that lives over here. Um, and then there's traditional strikes, and then there's political strikes. It's like, dude, people aren't going to work. <laughs> that's a strike. Um so anyway, I mean, yeah, there, there's so so the the ones that we're seeing, I think L.A. would be considered a traditional strike because um, they had a, a fund balance of like 30 percent, which when we say thir- fund balance reserves. Right. The, the, the district had a reserve of 30 percent 
of um, their overall budget, which is like enormous. Like for for folks who are not familiar with with how public finance works, and I know this is like yeah, yeah, <laughs> it, it's like you should. I'm not going to prescribe uniformly, but like if you have that large of a district, like three to five percent is fine. Yeah, like you're fine. Like state funding is compared to the private sector, um, what do you call it? Very consistent. You know what I mean. And so you shouldn't have a reserve of more than three, five percent. And the only way that you build that up is bit by not paying people, you know. Um, so and that was the same way with like uh, the Southwest, the, the strikes in Washington. They had received all this money and then they were essentially trying to stash it away. And like it's not even going to like it's not like in the private sector where it's going to a CEO like they are just sitting on it. Mm-hmm. And um, but whereas like West Virginia and Arizona and stuff like that, the target was the state for not adequately funding education and so that's um probably what you you know would see more in oregon because in washington we got the money it was just about the bosses giving it to people Mm -hmm. whereas oregon you're um i think correct me if i'm wrong Mm -hmm. it's a matter of actually being able to generate the funding to adequately pay yeah so oregon's funding conundrum kind of comes from 1990 um when we passed measure five Um, So in a lot of states and up until 1990, funding is for schools happens largely at the local level through property taxes. um, And then is the rest of it's made up for state fund like income tax and measure five flipped it so that about 65 percent of the funds that schools, public schools receive in Oregon come from income tax and like state fund budget. Um, and then the rest is comes from the local uh, property taxes, um, which kind of made it we're fight it's pitting public sort you know funds against each other. So we're now coming from the same state budget as everything else that the state legislature has to fund, and it also makes it a little bit more volatile because like if you think about income tax and how much we're bringing in in two thousand and eight versus now, you know that's a big dip in funding. Um, and then of course in 96, 97, we limited how much we could raise property taxes as well. So Oregon is also not allowed to raise property taxes to increase school funds. Like voters struck that down. And then we have in like 99, we looked at, they did a big study and they, every biennium, they do what's called the quality education model in Oregon. So they study and they come out with this budget of this is what we need to fund education properly in Oregon. You know, we need to do this, we need to do that. And every single year, um, the legislature has to come up with a report on why they can't do that. Mm -hmm. So we've never had it funded properly. Every year they come up with their, well, we didn't get enough money here, we didn't get money there, this is why we can't fund education properly. And that legally exempts them from having to meet the quality education model that, you know, the experts have said we need. Um, so that is the problem that we're looking at with funding for Oregon right now. Um, we do, and it's always been like a lot of hand wringing, you know, we go as OEA and we were like, Oh, you know, we, my local, like I can look at my edu- my paraeducators, they literally have to have a fundraiser like party, Um, just so that they can have an emergency fund. So if one of them goes to the hospital, they can get an emergency. Like, they're not paid enough. (laughs) We're like, the district knows this. Like, the district knows we pay our people so poorly that they have to have a fundraiser. But when you go to the bargaining table, when you go to the state, when you talk to any legislator, it's a lot of, like, but there's just where we just don't have the money. Mm -hmm. And we can't do anything. Like, Oregon won't pass the sales tax and... Oh, what to do, you know? <laughs> yeah, funny, and, <laughs> funny how all these issues strangely over, overlap, I wonder. I know. Yeah. And so now this year we have like the super majority and people are fired up and they're like, yes, we can finally, like, you don't have that excuse of <laughs> no Republicans will sign on for this, so it'll never pass. Um, we can actually like make some like comprehensive changes because, you know, we have pretty low graduation rates, but we also have the lowest corporate income tax in the whole United States. Um, We don't fund education properly, but, you know, we make these sweetheart deals with Nike saying, Mm -hmm. well, we won't tax you, though, you know. 
So people are talking about, people are getting fired up. It's become part of everyday conversation around education, conversation around education, finally. Um, but there's still, you know, it's, it's that very passive Oregon <laughs> demeanor of like, well, but it'll go to referendum. And it's like, we don't care. <laughs> like, let's get it done. All right, I'd like to call this meeting of the PTA to or diddly order, and let's see if we can't put an end to this strike fuss, huh? Mrs. Krabappel, why don't you begin? Boo! Oh, boo yourself. Our demands are simple. A small cost of living increase and some better equipment and supplies for your children. Oh, that's oh, easy. Right. Give it to them! <laughs> yeah, in the dream world, we have a very tight budget to do what she's asking. We'd have to raise taxes. Oh. Raise! Oh. Right. Too high as they are now. Yeah. Yeah. It's your children's future. Oh, yeah, children, children, yes. children are important. Yes. Yes. It'll cost you. Go yes. to taxes. Right. 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 Not yes. to oh, taxes. Right. Come on. She All right, that's a good point. It's good. Right. Yes. Oh, oh, yeah, the taxes. That, that means money. The finger thing means the taxes. Well, I guess this is a case where we'll have to agree to disagree. I don't agree to that. Neither do I. <laughs> this is a deli of a pickle. So yeah, so when we're talking about like we have the super majority and like teachers are talking about it more, we're talking about it in like a very vernacular sense and like we're talking about how we're funding education on a very accessible level. And I think part of it is getting people engaged and involved in things that don't seem too radical, but also are speaking to them. So, you know, we're on the eve of uh, President's Day and President's Day for OEA is going to be a big action in Salem, trying to get a thousand members to show up and march on the Capitol, which I their goal was a thousand. I think they're going to have way more than a thousand there tomorrow. Cool. Um, is my prediction. <laughs> oh. um, like my local had a, like a goal of bringing 10 percent and I think we're bringing like 20 some percent. New at noon, a rally is just wrapping up in Salem. Several thousand people came out to the state capitol to support public education. KGW's Tim Gordon is there live this noon. Tim, the teachers union put this on. Brenda, it did so. You know, it was well organized. I'll step out of the way and show you kind of the remnants of the rally here. Uh, I'd say there are close to 4,000 people here at its height. There were teachers and students and families here at the capitol to say Oregon needs to step up. They deserve pencils, copy paper, rulers, binders, backpacks, staples, the basics! Yeah, they got fired up for that message, too. A teacher from Rosa Parks Elementary in Portland got the crowd going at one point. People from all over the state came in for this rally. They lamented Oregon's large class sizes, low graduation rates, and low level of funding by national standards. The problems created, they say, range from poor learning environments to even dangerous ones. KGW's Kristen Severance recently exposed the crisis of out-of-control kids who need more help than a teacher can provide, and the support, they say, is just not there. This was a call to action for lawmakers to better fund education. But I have friends who are here um, for that event who are going to come down with me who are teachers in Southern Oregon. And so a lot of when you hear legislators hem and haw about, well, you know, but can we actually get it done without it going to referendum? I think they think more towards like, but what will the people in the rest of the states say? Because I'm from Douglas County. There's a huge divide um, in Oregon where they're like, there's Portland and then there's everybody else, or there's Portland, Eugene, Salem and everybody else. Um, and there's a lot of resentment from the rest of Oregon towards Portland. But with this education issue and the momentum that's been building with different teacher strikes, teachers are kind of waking up to like, oh, right, we don't have what we need. Um, they did the big study on disrupted learning and they went across the state and we all have the same stories. Like every single district in the state has needs of students that aren't being met by their current funding. We all need more counselors. We all need more special educators. We all need more supports for our students who are coming with less due to outside economic factors, due to... In environment at large in Oregon and the economy at large in Oregon. 
Um, and I think that's been really unifying, unifying for teachers across the state. Not just in Oregon, too. That we've been talking right. a lot about that in Washington. There was just a big conference, sort of a conference rally, I think, in Tacoma with folks from around the state about exactly that issue. Exactly. Disrupted learning, student safety, teacher safety. And they're realizing it's not just an urban issue. It's not just, you know, these children coming in urban centers that are that don't have these social emotional skills. No, it's kids in Pendleton, it's kids in Medford, it's mm -hmm. kids in Umatilla. It's all across the state of Oregon where we're seeing the same results of different societal factors. Um, and so doing actions like the one in Salem, it's not my, I'm a big voice for, or I've, I advocated pushing for it, not because I think it'll matter at all to legislators. They're going to hear the message. They'll do whatever they do with it that they always do with it. They'll go, oh, we stand with teachers. We totally agree. And then not change their minds or do anything. It, it won't do anything with legislators. The ones who are with us are with us. The ones who don't want to increase school funding are probably going to give some lip service and then just go back to work. Um, but it's about building that confidence in teachers, that you showed up, you held a sign, and you stood up for and it's being framed as for your students because ultimately almost mm -hmm. every single teacher doesn't like their funding, their pensions are important, but they're not the most. The most important thing is that That's right. we are going into classrooms where we don't have what we need to meet the students' needs, not our needs. Um, That's right. this, it's about like what we have to give to the kids. Um, and I think as we do more accessible actions like this, we're going to see the momentum keep up if we can continue to do things that are safe for people who've never been politically activated. Um, I've been able to talk to my friends who are here from Southern Oregon and like the, they'll start talking about something. I'm like, you know, like these are some pretty uh, socialist ideas you're talking about, mm -hmm. you know, like <laughs> slipping in the like, well, you know what Mark said about that, <laughs> you know, and it's really like bringing up conversations that people have never had before. And not because they don't agree with them, but just because they don't have the words or the language around it. And it is a different world in Portland than it is in Douglas County um, in some ways. But the struggles are still the same. It's just about how people talk about it mm -hmm. and like where where their um, availability like of ways to places to have these conversations. Yeah, I, that's one of the <laughs> real joys of doing organizing work too, right? That a lot of times the people that you would assume are not allies, you assume this conversation is going to mm -hmm. be hard. You're going into it kind of with your defenses up, like, oh, it's going to be hard to get this person to get on board with our direct action. And, and you'll find allies where you wouldn't expect it. And by the same token, you'll assume people are your allies in something because they got the right hairstyle or they live in the right neighborhood <laughs> and they are just not ready to take that step. It's so interesting. Yeah, yeah I know what haircut you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> we all do. Yeah. Well, I would say, like, the difference between Oregon and Washington, if we're, ta if we're just talking about the Pacific Northwest... Um, is that in Washington, we got the money, right? Mm -hmm. And everybody got raises. Um, there's variants, but, like, most people got raises. Um, definitely the majority of the state. And uh, so it's like, we got the raises, now what? And our now, now our thing is, like, well, now we want more uh, counselors and psychs and nurses mm -hmm. because we have our own funding formula, and it is also um, inadequate. Yeah. And so... You know, it's hot. Like the way I see it, it's like how to members push other members um, to understand that like we're asking for these things because the kids that are coming into the classrooms are like so fucked up. Like from mm -hmm. personal, like from their parents working three jobs and not being um, around to tutor yeah. them, or, mm -hmm. or just even provide parental nurturing and um, uh, and all, and all the stuff that that are. Um, direct consequence of of capitalism and so you know the i personally see it as a limitation that the best we could ask for is just more counselors because it seems to me like that's a band-aid like yeah what we need are better jobs in the yeah. state like that we pay better housing. Not, yeah housing <laughs> yeah. like we need so many more things for our students and i think it's it's interesting we i mean the if you're talking about the washington state example we have that um that huge push to get the mccleary decision to get that funding but i think if you asked members throughout the state at any point during that you know time what is it that you need most some people would certainly say 
you know, salary and benefits. But a lot of people, parallel to that whole process, were asking for better staffing levels, asking for smaller class sizes, asking for um, a, a complex mix of whether it's more yeah. counselors, more support staff. And so um, I think it, it's it's frustrating that there's a way to frame that struggle from the outside is like, okay, now you guys got, you know, you got this money and now you want this too. Or do it. No, those are two complex parallel drives that have been going on in education for decades in Washington state, you know, the need for staffing and the need for salaries, you know. But, do you, but my point is that like, that's the difference between union consciousness and political consciousness is that Union consciousness is saying we still need counselors, whereas political consciousness would be like, no, we need jobs for people. Like, mm -hmm. we need housing. And so it's hard to get people that I would say, like, I, I think our council are, like, is a pretty good, by labor note standards, <laughs> everybody's pretty uh, union consciousness, or at least that's the way that I see it in, mm -hmm. our, in our council. But they're not to the point of recognizing that the reason why the students come to class so fucked up is because they're poor, is because of poverty, and that's the number one indicator. I mean, they know that, mm -hmm. right? That socioeconomic status is the number one indicator of student success. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that they see the union as a way of alleviating that. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's, the, that's, that's what I see as, as um, our job as union. Well, I'm a staffer. I can't do anything, <laughs> right? So. But as, you know, the types of conversations need to happen within members and that type of vision. We do like an educator roundtable in East County um, every year. And, you know, we have like five or six different legislators come and they sit and they listen to teachers. And it, I've gone for the last few years. And this year was, I definitely could feel the change though in conversation because we started talking about this, the whole OEA's push on disruptive learning has been going on for like over a year. They've been, OEA has been doing listening sessions, town halls, so people are very well aware and very well spoken on the challenges in their classrooms, which has always been what we talk about in an educator roundtable. Um, but this year, I think I, you know, chimed in pretty early and said, like, you know, we talk about this, but we all, as teachers, recognize that it's an intersectional struggle. This isn't just about teaching it's about housing it's about food it's about healthcare access it's about all these things and i just saw everyone who was kind of at the table with me was like yeah <laughs> <laughs> and you know like we've been dealing with this and reynolds and gresham and park rose and david douglas for years like this disruptive learning conversation like we've been having it forever you know now that beaverton's having it it's getting a little more kgw attention but you know <laughs> um <laughs> funny how these things tend to develop that way yeah but i think mm -hmm. and i mean granted east county like uniserve and our unions are a little farther left we're the ones that push singing solidarity forever instead of the <laughs> national anthem at at the union things like we're we recognizing that i am in kind of a <laughs> exceptionally left area of OEA. Um, we, like, I, I'm hearing much more and seeing much more of the political consciousness um, attached to the union um, consciousness just in how we're talking about the struggles in schools. And I think we'll be seeing and hearing more and more about it because, like, there is so much conversation around housing. There is so much conversation just nationally and especially at the state. Um, and the more that we have that and we can connect these issues as all being part of one big capitalist pie, um, I think we're going to hear those conversations changing just even with your non-activated members. I think it speaks to the importance, too, of um, solidarity among locals because when you mm -hmm. think about doing you know actions to change our housing affordable housing situation or access to health care it's not going to be your local teachers union that's you know doing that on their own it's because we're able to build coalitions across you know different labor mm -hmm. sectors and do whether it's legislative yeah. priorities or or more direct stuff well i'm building those connections between like y'all are trying to pass like comprehensive funding for housing like teachers care mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. we got thousands of members that might be interested in knocking doors if you just if we can bridge those that's right common issues yeah since we're running out of time uh really quick uh, can can you talk about uh your experience in los angeles 
No, I can't because I wasn't able to freaking go. I had I was there oh. for a training and then I ditched the second day to try to get over there and it was too late. Oh. Yeah, I was super sad. That sucks. Yeah, it does suck. I agree. Hundreds of teachers in Oakland hitting the picket lines for the second day of their strike and they're adding something new to their list of demands. Teachers are rallying and marching right now. This is the negotiations between the union and the school district are back on this afternoon. KPX 5's Kit Doe is live in Oakland for the very latest. Kit. Yeah, this is day two, and it continues to pick up momentum. This is the largest gathering of the strike so far. Multiple marches have converged here at Defremery Park. Thousands gathered here, an impressive display of community support. And the district has taken notice. Right now, both sides are behind closed doors at an undisclosed location at the negotiating table, and both sides are hopeful. Day two of the big strike started well before sunrise, and it was no mistake that one of the largest protests of the morning was here at Roots International Academy. Back in December, the board voted to close Roots by the end of the year because of low test scores, and they're not the only ones. In fact, the district is looking at closing or consolidating a number of schools with dwindling enrollment. And so on the second day of the big strike, the teachers union is adding school closures to its list of demands, which already includes smaller class sizes and better pay. To address our de the bargaining demands, you must address the issue of school closure. So that conversation will happen between um, OEA and the school district. Can you give any suggestions for where people listening in who want to like either learn more or help support, say, local portland metro or even i mean well this is this show is listened to by the show is listened to by people in estonia um at least awesome. in the american context any suggestions or recommendations you can give to folks about how they can t they can support slash get involved or even like find out more you don't have to be a business leader you don't have to be a parent you don't have to be anybody you don't have to be a homeowner but to run for school boards so mm -hmm. that's a big step like that's not like a little thing you can do but a big thing you can do is start like talking about who we are electing for school boards and who we are electing for state rep positions and these sort of people who have a more direct hand and a louder voice and funding um and realizing like people get into these roles and then they learn as they go like you don't have to be a political science background to get into school board or to get even be a state rep like if you are passionate and you are, have the ability to do so like let's encourage people with the right ideas to start running for elected positions or if you have friends that have heard maybe once or twice that they should be running for office and they haven't taken somebody up, it's really important to keep asking those natural leaders in your community um, if they're able, especially for school board. It's, it's an area that I know we have a, a lot of need. You know? Yeah, that was the that was the thing of like when the when the religious right moral majority was getting gaining power in the seventies and eighties, they targeted school boards across the country. Mm -hmm. And because it was kind of wasn't seen as a site of struggle, they they won they uh, they won a lot. Mm -hmm. Hell, even just like neighborhood associations, like just people getting involved in these very small sections um, of the electoral system. Um, although I do not feel like electoral is the ultimate answer to everything, um, I do feel like we can make change, you know, through dual power and building some strength in those areas. Yeah. I want to just say it's a small thing, too, that um, it feels dorky, but um, if you can, I really enjoy asking people in my daily life about their union membership. You're at the store. It's okay just to ask somebody, like, oh, and is this a union rep? Like, to begin to have those um, conversations, and I know to have that it feels important to me to have that part of my um, of my life visible for my students, too, just to normalize that, hey, we're it's normal to be a union member. It's normal to be active in your union. It's something that we talk about. It's something that is a big part of our lives. I would recommend um, being a part of the Portland DSA Labor Working Group. And we actually have really <laughs> three super relevant things coming up. Awesome. Go for it. One is um, one way to, to, to learn more and get involved is to uh, try to start a union at your work. Uh, so we're doing a how to you how to organize a union 101 class. It's on uh, Wednesday, February 27th at 6:30 at the uh, Sunnyside Community House, and so you have to register to attend. So um, 
uh, contact uh, someone at uh, Labor Working Group at Portland DSA um, in order to register. Um, another thing is uh, there's a socialist job fair, um, and that's Wednesday, March 27th from 6.30 to 8.30. Uh, the location is TBA because it's a little bit away, but um, that's going on. And then there's, of course, the Labor Notes School, if you want to talk about that, Marge. Oh, um, yeah, the Labor Notes, uh, as an organization, has put on these schools in Portland. Um, uh, let's see, last one was two years ago. We have one coming up on April 6th. I know our um, Uniserve um, has uh, agreed to donate and send some members. Our local, also at EEA, is going to be sending some folks. It's just an opportunity to get together with others. You don't have to be a union member, but it's a place to learn about how to create union solidarity, how to build stronger campaigns um, and networks within and across unions. It's been a really valuable mm -hmm. experience for people who have gone in the past. We're looking forward to it this year. So again, that's April 6th. It's from 9 to 4.30, um, likely up by the airport at the Carpenters Training Center. And that's what's really cool about the labor notes, like troublemaker school and like pretty much anything with labor notes is that I'm a teacher, but I'm also working with the head of the construction or union, you know, with people who are pipe fitters, people who are nurses, people who are very different um, organizations than I am, um, but we all are in the same struggle. And I highly recommend, no matter where you are in the United States, keeping an eye out for labor notes because they're in, you know, so focus or not focused. Um, their main headquarters is in like Detroit. Situated in there. Yes, yeah. situated. Oh, yeah, the, the, that's one thing I will, will recommend. And reading, if you can, subscribing even better to labor reporting, either labor notes proper, or there's also the Northwest Labor Press. Mm -hmm. uh, the latest issue, I think, is somewhere over on that pile of stuff that I need <laughs> to read, um, which you can, you know, it's kind of a thing where, yeah, this is labor reporting. has been going, well, shit, all, all, all reporting in journalism has been under attack for years. And... Um, there and but there are ways that you can kind of uh, because the ad, the ad supported model of journalism is I won't say finally dying but you can still support that yeah support like I said, it's cheap subscriptions and it's gonna it'll help um, help people get out there and write up the stuff and get it documented um, in fact I think yeah well, I think Dom is one of the one of the main reporters for Northwest Labor Press is also a DSA member also yeah the uh, a a podcast you might want to check out is the belabored podcast that I believe is is either connected to either labor notes or dissent magazine dissent. But, yeah hosted by um, hosted by Sarah Jaffe and Michelle Chen and they um, they you know they uh, like it comes out every I think every two weeks or so but they, you know and again it's interviews and conversations with people on the ground fighting this and Sarah Jaffe went out there with her podcasting kit and was out broadcasting from uh, from you know Los Angeles and you know it's kind of a thing where you know the, <laughs> the strikes and organized labor is like this stuff isn't going away we're, we're we are returning to we're kind of like almost going to be forced to return to like 1930s level of of uh, labor mobilization just to start fighting back against decades of demobilization and neoliberal bullshit and all sorts of stuff. My favorite um, union radical podcast is not not classically a union podcast, but I highly think I highly I think highly of Street Fight Radio as being an amazing radicalizing talking about workplace issues for being the number one anarcho comedy podcast um they really break down labor struggle in a very easy to digest uh, way <laughs> out of columbus ohio <laughs> Uh, if I could also recommend Working History by the Southern, La uh, Southern Labor Studies Association, they give like they interview a lot of authors, so they're uh, highly highly trained in their field, um, and they're always really good. Oh, also there is a there is a UK podcast called Working Class Histories mm -hmm. that'll go really. In I mean, they went they'll have like episodes about oh good god, uh, you know, like histories of the IWW, or they they did an episode about the League of uh, Revolutionary Black Workers. Um, and so is their Instagram if you don't have time for podcasts in your life. 
Mm-hmm. Even just their Instagram has great stories and pictures. Mm-hmm. Instagram <laughs> and their and their Facebook feed. And there's I think Maximilian Alvarez has a uh, has a good podcast about talking to working class people who don't get heard otherwise that I will link to in the show notes. Anything you uh Marjorie, anything you you could recommend as for stuff that folks folks could No, this made me realize that I, I feel like I'm sort of a latecomer to the podcast, so I've been furiously like writing on my hand and other um the making notes about uh, podcasting is something that um I'm be just only beginning to learn about, so I'm excited to explore some of those. Yeah, I can even. I mean, that's the thing is, it's it's, it's been the, it's this has been like the, my primary medium of what I, of how I've like learned about the world and even enjoyed yeah. Christ like ten years now, like Absolutely. more yeah, more great. so than you know TV, books, music, uh, video games, movies. Uh, you know, I have earbuds in my head like twelve hours a day or yeah. something like that, and um, and yeah, it's kind of you know as a educational and agitational radicalizing format. They're great for it. Um, yeah, I have noticed. Like, I feel like I I only have I think one podcast on my you know feed or whatever, and it's um, reveal for investigative journalism because I feel like there isn't much investigative journalism um, going on uh, outside of that. But that's that's interesting. I'll try to explore some kind of labor history and stuff. Um, I say, if you like any suggestions, I can offer you twenty. Yeah. Um, I subscribe to more than a few dozen shows that I listen to occasionally. Lousy teachers trying to palm off our kids on us. But, Dad, by striking, they're trying to affect a change in management so that they can be happier and more productive. Lisa, if you don't like your job, you don't strike. You just go in every day and do it really half-assed. That's the American way. All right, wrapping things up, if you have anything, any other like upcoming events to promote. I can offer that I am a member of the Hands Off Venezuela Portland group. So if you are interested in learning more about uh, what's going on in Venezuela and um, why we should oppose any type of military intervention, please go ahead and find us on Facebook and like us. Yeah, same with, I would say, too, um, whether it's your local teachers union, um, your uh, Uniserve, a labor council, if you're on Facebook um, or uh, you find that those organizations have um, other ways of reaching out it's not hard to just follow them to find out what's going on with the, your local teachers i know facebook mm-hmm. is what we happen to use but there might be other locals that um you know have an open forum like that where you can find out what's a priority for your teachers local yeah um yeah and i would be more than happy to talk to people about um issues in teaching or issues or getting involved in like hyper local government is also <laughs> something I always want to try to get people to join community organizations and like radicalize their neighborhood associations. So if anyone ever wants to talk to me, um, I'm Jody dot folk doll at gmail.com and I'm Jeremy will post the link cause my name's not super easy to spell, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I always love talking to people about things like that. So, and I'm not on Twitter, really, so that would have been much easier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, neither am I. I still don't understand Twitter. Like, I have one, but just the concept yeah. is just ir- irreconcilable in my mm-hmm. Like, why? Yeah, I'll get, if you send me a message, I'll get it, like, five months later. Right. <laughs> jokes, and, jokes and cat pictures and, like, <laughs> podcast links to, like, dude, listen to this. Uh, anyway, I'd like to thank thank you all for joining me today. And also, if you'd like to get in touch with the show at all, no one ever does, but I still uh, throw these <laughs> out there. You can uh, email us at givingthemic at gmail.com. I just want to say one last thing before we left. Go for it. Fuck charter schools. Yeah, I don't want it. To, yeah, I don't want to waste any and vouchers. Oh, please let's. Oh, and let vouchers us too. Not forget. Yep. <laughs> yeah, they were like charter schools um, emerged as a way to circumvent desegregation, and so they're just like completely indef- ind- indefensible as an institution. So I just really wanted to say that. I'm sorry, Jerry. Oh no, that's the thing. Yeah, well said. Yeah, we we could do like another hour on charter schools. Let's see. Oh um, probably should at some points. Um, but yes, thank you for a uh, good thing we got. Uh, we get that in there too. Find we are on Facebook at just look for giving the mic, uh, all one word. Twitter at giving the mic. We if you'd like to if you like what you hear and you'd like to help us uh, actually you know give some monetary support to help us make the show and pay for uh, both bandwidth and uh, equipment costs because I'm using a lot of like used uh, a lot of used stuff a lot of Craigslist finds for, uh, help produce the show. You can find us at patreoncom uh, giving the mic. Even like um, you know like a one time donation or even like a, like a dollar a month like helps far more than you can you'd believe. Oh, also, and if you if you happen to have iTunes and you want to give us like a little review, apparently it has like a strangely beneficial amount. Do you can give it a little rating, a little like I like the show, thanks, click, and it, you know it helps it helps the algorithm share the show with others. 
All right, and I think that pretty much wraps everything up. If you know any final words from our assembled uh, our assembled panel. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yes, thanks for coming out. Yeah, thanks. This is um, yeah, I appreciate it. Again, my name is Candy. Fuck Charter Schools Herrera, <laughs> and uh, you know my my information will be uh, posted on your uh, when you post a podcast. Excellent. All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, everyone, and good night. Thank you. All right, and we're out. Yay. Yay. There is power in a factory. There is power in the land. There is power in the hand of the worker. But it all amounts to nothing if together we don't stand. Oh, there is power in a union. Now the lessons of the past were all learned with workers' blood. The mistakes of the bosses we must pay for. From the cities and the farmlands to the factories full of mud. War has always been the boss's way, sir. The union forever defending our rights. Down with the black flag, all workers unite with our brothers and our sisters from many far off lands. Oh, there is power in a union. Now I long for the morning when they all realize brutality and unjust laws cannot defeat us. But who'll defend the worker who cannot organize when the bosses send their lackeys, sir, to cheat us? Money speaks for money, the devil for his own. Who'll come to speak for the skin and the bone? What a comfort to the widow and a light to the child. Oh, there is power in a union. The union forever. Sisters, together we all stand. Oh, there is power in a union. Stay strong, Wisconsin. The Mountain Goats and every musician I know are with you. Like, same thing with Porky now. I always yell at people outside of Porky now in my head. I'm like, it's not that good. <laughs> there are so many better tacos in Portland. Like, that is not it. <laughs> Which one? Porque no. Oh, I can't remember. Really? If, yeah. I can't remember if that's the same. If that's owned by the is that owned by the same people who own uh, Ole Ole or I think cause, or, or the people who own, own Ole Ole. The, there's a what is it the Takiera Cha Cha or am I thinking of something else? Cha Cha Cha. Yeah, the one. Well, the, yeah, the one that's up on Broadway, the much more like uh, bougier, fancier. Yeah. I think it's owned by the same fan, owned by the yeah, the same couple. Yeah, I don't know. It's not bad. It's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Their margaritas it's... are good, but like just watching people being like lined up in the rain, I'm like, oh god. Yeah, at some point it's just kind of like the uh, yeah, Why? The, the fetishization and the madness of crowds. Makes me want to walk by and say, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Do that. And this this is the uh, the little this is the headphone the little headphone amp that'll take that um, will let us hear each other. Because the thing I learned from college radio is never let anybody talk on mic if they don't have headphones on. Yeah. Which is why so uh, which is why uh, so many like lefty podcasts, because a lot of people who are really you know knowledgeable about a lot of things, but never did broadcasting or college radio and always fuck up their audio and drive me nuts. Mm. Dude, I have that same problem with Telesor. And like it never used to bother mm -hmm. me until I dated somebody who's a cinematographer. And now, before it's just like I'm gonna listen to Telesaur. Now I'm like fucking Telesaur. Like it doesn't matter how high I put up the volume mm -hmm. or how, the treble. Like it's just not loud enough. Yeah, there is a. I had to, um, especially when doing the, uh, listening to the um, the kind of the like the meaning of Marxism. You know, the little trot book class. That because somebody um, you know, we're reading chapters of it for the recently concluded group. Somebody had did their own kind of like volunteer audiobook reading, but um, sometimes the um, you know bless you know bless the dude's heart. But like sometimes the his EQ was off, and it would either be like kind of way too whispery or uh, or quiet or whatever. And I I, I had to go out and find. A, I found a program that will let you EQ like uh, any audio coming off your computer, so you can do it for like YouTube audio too. Oh, nice! 
Denise, what's it called? Um, I don't. <laughs> that's it. Uh, um, let, remind me afterwards. I'll pull it up off. Pull it up af, uh, off of my uh, my work laptop. But it's great because it's kind of like okay, we're gonna cut. We're gonna cut this frequency, and you lose all the whispery, all the the, 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 the high oh, sibilance. Dude, anything that Telesaur puts on YouTube, it's like it. Sometimes I get so upset that I can't hear it. I'm like, this isn't fucking worth it. <laughs> It's all so right. bad. I was wondering so bad. Yeah. All right. And let's do a. Uh, the, the the real fun part is just because we have four different people and four different mics and trying to get. Let me just turn myself up in my headphones. There we go. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. And let me make sure that I don't have too much bass.